Haiti's earthquake in 2010 changed a lot of lives. 360,000 people died, 320,000 were injured, over 1.8 million lost their homes in the already poorest country of the atmosphere, where 60% of the people live below $2 a day. But Haiti's earthquake also changed my life and my family's. By circumstances in life, they were there. Well, I was actually sitting on my office desk in the UK. I was there at the time, and with a lot of frustration, I was seeing in photos and in pictures what my mom and my brother, which, by the way, are sitting down in the audience, were doing there. And it, stories that you wouldn't even imagine, saving lives. And I was in my office thinking, well, what am I doing working just for ice cream and shampoo? No disrespect. <laughs> But um, I, I think at that moment I had a breaking point. I really questioned what I, what I was doing or how I was doing it, and I took the day off. So that evening, my phone rings at midnight, and it was my big boss. I said, uh-oh, oh, you know, why is my big boss calling me? Am I in trouble already? <laughs> and he said, Vivi, are you a doctor? No. Are you an engineer? No. Are you a social worker? No. So what the hell are you going to do in Haiti? Vivi, think, think big. Think through your business skills, through your network. Think outside the box. What could you actually do that adds value in Haiti? Don't quit your job. I was really close to do it. And think about it. Sleep over it. If you decide to do something, call me tomorrow morning, and I'll promise you that in or outside the company limits, we'll make something happen. I'll tell you, I don't think he realizes the effect that that phone call had. Uh, he converted that evening my frustration into actions. To make the story short, from that phone call to today, um, along with my mom, my brother, two Unilever colleagues, and four other friends, we have co-founded an NGO in the UK, which is called H2H Help to Haiti. To date, uh, we've been uh, raising over $120,000 um, 300 tons of goods and foods, and over half a million dollars in medical treatment. And you know how it started? By literally running. You know, I <laughs> we started running for sponsorships. We started running, doing any type of activities, charity events and parties. And that's when we had one of the first lessons. When you start doing something good, you meet good people along the way. And with that, I'm counting my Unilever colleagues, my friends, my family, how we started doing everything. I wasn't even running to catch a boss, by the way. And, you know, <laughs> between the, the, the seven of us, we've been running now eight half marathons in, in the four years. So what have we been focused on with age to age? Four key areas, and I start by the first one, humanitarian work. And I'll be swapping my stories with two hats, my NGO and the personal story, and then also the corporate one. Yeah? Because at the end, I'm also here to show that it's not incompatible to do both. So if we think as an investment, we had to focus on the infrastructure and humanitarian work, basic supplies, right after the eighth work, that's where we focus. Then on education and sanitation. In the, four, in the last four years, we've been paid the education of 74 kids of our community. So to that, our scope was, was very limited, 150 people outside Port-au-Prince, the capital, in a small community that is called Titanien. And we've been paid the education of those 74 kids and it's actually when we had one of the most important lessons, second lesson. Shut up and listen. It's actually from a good TED talk, uh, by the way. And we, with our best intention, we, when we were raising money, we thought that you know, we have to focus and build houses. Well, guess what? That wasn't the priority for them. They were already living in tents outside. For them, the most important thing was to send the kids to school. Yeah. Do we do that with our consumers? Do we actually listen what they need to understand? With our best intentions, we try to think what is best for them, but do we actually take the time to shut up and listen? I learned that lesson in Haiti. So the third pillar was actually the infrastructure, when we build the houses based on the family's priorities, and to our first two latrinas. And when I say we, I meant the community. They built it. They did it. We only facilitated, but we created employment, and that's how the whole thing started. And then, and the most important part, because it's the first three pillars we could actually claim it as an investment, yeah, to put the tools in place, but none of them were sustainable. Yeah? We could call it in brackets a charity, if you like. I don't like that word personally, and I'll tell you later why. 
So the third pillar is how do we make it? How can we leave something that that is ongoing and that really empowers the local community? And that's where the microcredits came in. The story of the microcredits, and and this I really have to to quote it. You know the chain when you start doing something good, you meet good people along the way, and that's when my now best friend and my partner in crime, Bernd Beiser, when we were having a bottle of wine, he said, "You know what? I'm reading this book, Professor Yunus, Nobel Prize." The guy has won a Nobel Prize because he proved in Bangladesh in 10 years how to reduce poverty by 52 percent with a very simple concept of microcredits, loaning very small amounts of money to people in need who would ever ever have access to a bank account and giving them an opportunity to create their own business. Fifi, can you imagine if we do microcredits in Haiti? <laughs> then, can you imagine that with a bottle of wine? Huh? Can you imagine? <laughs> That we then send an email to Professor Yunus and we tell him that that we actually were inspired by him and we are going to still with pride something that already works. Why do we have to reinvent the wheel? Sometimes we're so desperate in social innovation that we all think, oh, why can't we? Guys, solutions are out there. The difficult part is to actually implement them to make them happen, right? So I'm happy to say that uh, today we have uh, implemented 140 microcredits to 84 families, and that we not only send an email to Professor Yunus, we met him. <laughs> we met him last year, and and that's actually when the next part happens. Putting in blank because I'm changing hats. Yeah, this is just a personal story about you know what we do over the weekends, over evenings, or in a personal time. Now I'm going to put my corporate hat. Because at the end, I'm not a social worker, a medical doctor, or anything. Yeah. So, during this journey, in our community, one day we we go, we try to go there at least twice a year. So we were in the Christmas party with the kids, and you know, playing with the goat. <laughs> and when we had time to dinner, none of the kids washed their hands. And I'm thinking, Jesus, I work in a company that we have soap, right? And yet, in our community, none of the kids wash their hands. The previous talk, you've, you've heard and understood how important it is, or how powerful it is, the bar of soap. So that's when we started thinking, okay, then how do we make this happen at the corporate level in Unilever in Haiti? And at the end, the answer was the same one. So if Unilever was already doing a lot of good things, why not steal in with pride a lot of good practices that we were doing in India, in Nigeria, in Vietnam, and all the stories that you've been listening to the mo in, during during the day. We said, okay, well, let's try to do it. And everybody, yeah, that's a good idea, but let's try to do it, it's okay. Everybody thinks it's a cool idea. And how do you get the money? And how do you get it in place? And how do you do a business pitch to show that you know we also have to take care of Haiti? For me now, it's actually a privilege to be here to talk about Haiti because unless there's another hurricane, unless there's another earthquake, or unless there's a big cholera pandemic, I don't think we're going to see Haiti in the news. I'm from Colombia. A lot of people say, but Vivi, why Haiti and not Colombia? As I said, personal circumstances, it doesn't really matter where it is. The point is to start an, an act. That's where I personally feel that I found my sweet spot in, in, in the company because I was able to do what I, what, I, what I think I'm good at, what I feel passionate about, but more importantly, something that adds value. So in one meeting in Barcelona, Where I'm, where I'm actually based, after half an hour, someone said, you know what, I believe in your crazy pilot, just go and do it. Yay, so we got the money. And that was a few months back. Now, in one month, we're going with all the business team to Haiti. And we're intending to make a difference. We're intending to make sure that in all the rural areas, we will have soap, we will have basic hygiene products. And our KPIs, yeah, more than numbers, as Andrew was saying, our KPIs will be around how to reduce preventable diseases. Yeah, how to uplift self-esteem, how to do a lot of things, because the beauty of that is that we have so many models that are already working. We just need to steal them with pride and apply them. There's another very important lesson that I really want to share. And emerging communities, emerging societies do not need charity. That's why I don't like that word. They simply need opportunities. They need to be listened with dignity. And really, the takeaway from this, there is no such thing as corporate social responsibility without individual social responsibility. There isn't. It has to come from the individual. 
just finished an MBA and people think, oh, you, you're smart now. Well, not really. I mean, yeah, it cost me a half kidney that I have in my bank to pay my MBA now. <laughs> but the reality is that they teach you very well the what. I'm not so sure on the why and how. That has to come from ourselves. Do we question how we do things, how we do business, why we do business itself? And that's, and, and that's the food for thought that I would, that I would like to leave. There's, there's a quote from one of our senior members that says, a dreamer first has to be an achiever. And I think that is absolutely right. Because nobody would have ever listened in my company what we were doing or what we were intending and dreaming to do without the work that we were doing with our little NGO. And to prove how biased for action and how passionate we were about making a difference. We're fully aware we're not going to change the world, but we are definitely changing a lot of families' world. So, it's not looking easy, but I can guarantee you, it's not looking impossible either. There's a bright future outside. I'm standing up for Haiti. Are you standing up for something? Thank you.